seems all right. Great. So, um, yeah, so welcome to uh, Colloidal Materials uh, in 2012. And uh, we're going to do quite a lot of interesting things, hopefully, over the next uh, 18 hours. And um, this is basically the structure of the module on this slide. So we're going to do uh, 18 contact hours. And in those 18 hours, we'll go through a raft of different things that will hopefully integrate elements of chemistry and elements of physics and maybe elements of math that you've learned already. And uh, we're going to apply this to an area that may or may not be familiar to you, which is colloidal matter or colloid science. So um, we have, in a way, roughly, you can divide the topics into three different topics. And I've just coded them blue, orange, and green. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a little snapshot of what to expect before we actually would really, really start. So we're going we're gonna to go over in, you know, what are colloids? How can you make these kind of things? Um, we go a little bit into droplets, tiny bit into bubbles and foams. Mostly we'll focus on making particles. And then obviously there's lots of different particles that you can make. So I'm going to pick one or two that we're going to really kind of go in a little bit more in depth in. And the ones that I picked is like polymeric particles in this case, because the theory of that and the, the, the modules you've had with that in year two, you had polymer chemistry in year three, some of you would have polymer chemistry, would integrate quite nicely. If you would do it from an inorganic chemistry point of view, um, the inorganic chemistry that you've had is predominantly molecular and you will potentially run into trouble. So that's why we're going to focus on those. Um, then we're going to take that further. We're going to go to the, the cutting edge, which is anisotropic particles and supracolloidal particles, which are particles made from particles. Now, in order to understand this, we have to do a little bit of soft matter physics because we have to kind of see what's different if we go into the colloidal domain. What happens if we make things small? So, you know, can we still think that gravity would exist to small matter? Or are there other forces that we may or may not know yet that start to become dominant and therefore will start the influence processes of, you know, self-assembly, how these things behave in a liquid, how these things behave amongst each other, how they interact with each other, how they interact with substrates, and potentially, you know, what influence colloidal matter has on bulk properties of material. So for that, we need, we need to have some physical concepts for that. So and in order to integrate those physical concepts, we're going to look at some examples of materials that we can make then. So we're not only going to look at how to characterize the particles themselves, but a hot topic obviously is, you know, can we self-assemble the bottom-up approach? Can we make things, you know, from very, very small components? And how difficult can we get that? And, and what kind of complex structures can we actually make? We're going to focus with a little bit on, to, to give you a little bit of an idea, on how particles interact with uh, interfaces, in this case, soft interfaces. And we're going to see how these things, how particles can crystallize into fantastic materials and how they potentially then can um, have a solution to band gap type of structures needed for photonic devices or electronic devices. So that's roughly the layout of the module. So um, the end of this module, there'll be an exam. I think it's soon, right? It's like week nine or week 10. So we'll have a, we'll have a six week period in order to get this all done. And then hopefully you guys are all experts in, uh, in this field. So let's give you a little bit of an idea on what I mean with these dots, basically. So we're going to look at, for example, how to make things like this. So this is quite interesting. This is a, a, a picture, a scanning electron microscopy picture of a, of a polymer latex. And um, there's a few interesting things that you might see on this picture. And, and one of them is that, you know, most of these particles appear to be roughly all the same size. Apart from one, there's a big one just above the scale bar. So why is there one big one and like lots and lots of small ones? And then the more interesting thing is that all these small ones, they tend to organize themselves quite nicely. And if you look at, at, at certain phases, and if you pick one particle centrally, then you know the phase is kind of like flat. You can kind of see, okay, I pick one and then in most cases, they'll have six neighbors, yeah? But in some cases, if you look carefully, there are sites in which they have 
less than six neighbors. So the packing is different. So you go from hexagonal packing to kind of square packing. Yeah? So why do these things happen? And how can we make all these particles exactly the same size? That's one of the things what we're going to look at. So the process which I've picked, and this you can pick this process for any particle you want to make, but I've picked polymer particles, and this is what we need to understand, and what we hopefully will understand after we had a bunch of lectures. So at the moment, it looks like a pretty complex picture. But this picture with all these events that are going to happen, so there's chemical reactions that are going to happen, there's diffusions, the there's multiple phases, that will make sure that you will or you will not end up with particles that have the shape and the size distribution of the picture before that. And hopefully, uh, after you know, lecture four or five, we have an idea on how to make these things. We won't have an idea yet on why these things are quite happy in water, for example. That will come later. So this is something that you know, we'll, we'll focus on a little bit more in depth, a process called emulsion polymerization. And the name by itself already is kind of weird, because in a way it's, it's not really a polymerization of emulsion droplets. So, so after that, when we know a little bit on how we can make simple particles, we'll take it a level up and we'll go way more complex. So this is an example of one of our recent papers in which we take a, a, a plant spore uh, called a lycopodium spore, which you can see in the scanning electron microscopy picture A on the top left. And uh, we've decorated this specifically with an, a network of jelly polymeric particles. And we managed to decorate these things only on the outer rim of this rather intriguing structure. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that we can control exactly how many of these things we'll deposit on there and what the chemical composition of these types of things are. So the end product is a hybrid structure. A hybrid meaning there's at least two different components here. In one case, it's a biological spore, which has DNA coding and everything in it. In this case, we just got rid of that by, you know, if you boil an egg, you can't uh, grow anything anymore. The same thing with this, you put it in the oven, all the DNA stuff gets cooked and you can't really uh, grow a plant out of it anymore. And after that, you just modify it. So you'll get a combination between a synthetic material and, uh, and a biological material. If you wonder what picture D is, um, I don't know if you followed uh, the module by Pat Unwin on surface uh, matter. Uh, the people that have done might recognize an image like this. This is a confocal microscopy image which means that instead of uh, using natural light, you use a laser beam to excite uh, molecules that can fluoresce and that can then emit light at a higher frequency. And as, as a result of that, uh, that's what you de detect. So you get these nice hollow structures. So this is kind of a thing. Uh, well, we're going to look at more hybrid, more complex materials a bit later. And why do you want to look at complex materials? Because maybe they're more fun if you want to self-assemble them. Maybe they can move by themselves. That's kind of uh, stuff that's interesting, hopefully. Now this picture, um, the DLVO theory, is one of the major, major, major accomplishments by a bunch of physicists and physical chemists in college science. And unfortunately, it never won the Nobel Prize, which is a massive shame, maybe because there were four guys. Uh, there's again Landau, Verwijn, Overbeek, and the maximum is three. Uh, maybe because, you know, at a later stage, after they discovered the theory, there were some discrepancies with it. We will never know. Um, but how this exactly works is what we're going to look into detail at. And you might know a little bit of this diagram or already. You might know on a molecular level that there are attractive forces and that there are repulsive forces. So repulsive forces, for example, could be Coulomb repulsion if you have an anion and an anion and they come close, they repel each other. The same thing would happen if you would have an anionic particle and an anionic particle and they come close, they repel each other. Now the attractive forces, for example, could be the Van der Waals force or, or the London dispersion forces, which is effectively a, a, a contributor towards the Van der Waals forces. So in that particular case, you get an attractive force between two objects. And these objects could be atoms, but these objects could also be bigger. And then you have a, a balance between the two 
that gives you the overall force or the overall energy landscape. So this, is, uh, this picture is the interaction energy as a function of distance between two objects. And then the dotted line, you have a, a repulsive barrier and you have an attractive van der Waals attraction. So attraction is negative energy and uh, repulsion is positive energy. And you'll get an overall shape that basically will determine whether things attract or repel each other. Now, obviously, if you have two particles in water and you want to keep them apart, you want to have a repulsive barrier because otherwise, if they bump into each other, they collide and you no longer have two particles, you'll have one particle. And it then cascades on to end up with one massive particle. And that's not what you want. So how this works, we're going to go uh, in detail into. And we're going to link it up a little bit with, you know, what you might or might not know from molecular interactions already. Now then we have uh, some more fun. So, you know, particles can be pushed together on purpose. So here you see a relatively recent science paper um, from these guys. And uh, what they did is really cool. They, uh, they combined some microfluidics or some, um, um, basically some lithograph lithographic techniques to make little mini wells. So these wells are like 30 microns by 30 microns, cylindrical objects. And inside, it's like a you know, little reactor, basically. They put a bunch of particles in there. And then they put really small particles in there on top of that, or molecules. And sometimes there is a force, which is called depletion flocculation, which pushes larger objects together if you introduce an excess of smaller objects. And in this particular case, you know, if you would have two spheres, you will end up with two spheres bumping into each other. So you end up with a cluster, which is a dimer. And then obviously you can do this for three, for four, for five, for six, for seven, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can wonder what is the, what is the structure of this cluster? So you're almost you know, playing the same trick as if you would do with atoms, if you put two atoms together or three or four or five together. So imagine it's gold atoms. You know, what's the structure of the cluster? However, now we're looking at clusters that are way larger. So these particles are approximately a micron. So this is like, you know, cutting edge stuff at the moment. This is what people would like to know from a physics point of view. What is the optimized geometry of a dimer, a trimer, a tetramer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in order to understand that, they do the experiment, but they also do the simulation and the physics. So here you see, again, you see an energy curve here with an attractive term in this case that pushes these things together. And we'll go into that in more detail uh, later. Okay, then, you know, once we've understand the physics, what can we do? What do we mean with self-assembly? Self-assembly, for example, um, is a spontaneous formation of an organized suprastructure. You might have heard of the word supramolecular. Yeah? Supramolecular means a suprastructure made out of molecules. So you could just take the same word and change it a little bit, and you can call supracolloidal. Supracolloidal is a suprastructure made out of colloidal components. Yeah? And then the only form of self-assembly you potentially will have come across with, or the other form you will have seen, but you might have not, maybe not realized that it's also a form of self-assembly, is, is the left form here on this image, and which is basically just equilibrium-based self-assembly. So for example, simplistic uh, example on a molecular scale would be you take a soap molecule, sodium dodecyl sulfate, and you put it into water, and you add more and more soap, and at a certain moment you hit a critical micelle concentration, which means that these molecules then will self-assemble into a suprastructure. In this case, that suprastructure would be a cluster of these molecules, and they will introduce a new phase, which is a micellar phase in that case. In this particular picture over here, we had droplets, and on those droplets, we self-assembled by a reversible process in this case, because it was shear-induced small particles, and they stuck to the interface. And we could basically lock them on there and even predict what the packing patterns were. And then afterwards, we solidified the droplet and had a look with uh, SEM and TEM what this structure would be. So in, in this particular case, you let the system do itself, and you look at the end product. That's the self-assembled structure. On the right, however, is something which is a little bit more extreme to grasp which is, for example, the top picture over there. This is a vortex. So you'll have beads in a round bottom flask with a magnetic follower. 
And you have to turn the follower. And if you have two beats, they form a certain pattern, which is a picture taken from above. If it's three, four, five, they form a different type of pattern. So in this particular case, you have to keep continuing dissipating energy in order to maintain the structure. A natural example, for example, would be a flock of birds yeah, or a swarm of bees. The swarm as such, the structure of the swarm is a self-assembled structure. However, the bees have to keep flying. If they stop flying, they all fall down and you lose the structure. So you have to have continuous dissipation of energy in order to have to maintain this structure. So that's the difference between equilibrium self-assembly and dynamic self-assembly. And people have always been focusing on equilibrium self-assembly, but slowly but surely start to move towards the more complex dynamic stuff. What well, flock behavior, swarming behavior of ants and, and all those type of things. So there's a nice tutorial review on that. So at the bottom of all these slides, there's lots of references and you can look that up. It's, it's not compulsory to read, but if you want to read it, uh, then go for it. Okay, well, you can make beautiful structures like this. So here's a nice picture of, of monodispersed particles that are turned into this beautiful crystal. You think crystals? Crystals might only work for atoms, but in this particular case, crystals work beautifully with, uh, with particles as well. And if you think about it, you know, you think of a crystal structure, sodium chloride, it's just two different ping pong balls. Yeah, the crystal structure of gold is just the crystal structure of gold atoms. And you know, in every textbook, the atom is represented as just a ping pong ball. Yeah? It's maybe, it may not be a ping pong ball in real life, but in the textbook it is, and the structure roughly is, and the X-ray diffraction patterns show it's kind of a, a repetitive structure like that. So if I blow my ping pong ball up, why can't I do that also with particles? And the answer is you can. So we're gonna learn how that works. And then you can see in this picture that, okay, if you stack ping pong balls on top of each other, there's space left. Yeah, you might have heard uh, the packing densities of an FCC lattice, face centered cubic lattice. 74% by volume is ping pong balls. 26% is air. What if I backfill this now with a different material and then get rid of my ping pong balls? I end up with a structure like this. So this structure is called an inverse opal. And it happens to be a photonic band gap material, which means basically that certain frequencies or certain wavelengths cannot penetrate this material, which means it could be used, for example, um, to develop computers that um, operate on light rather than electricity. So there's a massive drive in order to make uh, materials like this. Or for example, you can stealth it so that a certain frequency doesn't propagate through, so heat seeking missiles won't see your object. Okay, 